Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Now, the message we're going to study together today is a message title, Is It Wrong to Have Money? And when you hear that, I'm sure that sometimes we would think we could be guilty because of that. We feel the guilt of that. Well, today I'd like to show you from God's Word basically two responses to the question, Is It Wrong to Have Money? Now, it's interesting because, frankly, all of us have money. It may be a little bit of money, and some of us have a lot of money, some of it has it liquid in cash, some of it has it in investments and maybe some more solid assets, but all of us have degrees of money, so is it really wrong to have money? And let's see what God has to say about it from his word so that we would be on God's page regarding the money that we have, and we would also throw in that possessions. But really, when you think about it, no matter how Christian you are, how dedicated you are, money really is a part of our life. We spend our life acquiring money, and then we spend our money enjoying life to some measure. Most of you have a nice car, nice clothes, you have a lifestyle that is relatively good, and if you live here in Hawaii, you know what I mean by that. Another wag said it this way, sometimes we spend our health getting our wealth. And there are those that really will pump real hard to get their wealth, but they're giving up their health to do that. And you might know some people. But it seems like when we get older now that we have a little bit of this wealth, then we have to take our wealth to try to get our health back again. How many know what I mean? Say amen on that. You can tell that we're doing that. And you think of the the billions of dollars that are just spent on vitamin supplements, let alone all the other things that go on. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just going to say that that's the way of life. That money is a part of our life, even as believers in Christ. Here's a question to ask you, whatever level you are in your spiritual walk with God. The last argument, or maybe the last couple of arguments that you had, was it over money, how it was spent or used or abused, or possessions, how they were used or abused in your family or your relationship? When was the last time you've had an issue regarding money and your conversation was an argument over that? It could have happened even as early as this morning. And by the way, if it did happen, your mate didn't tell me that, okay? I don't know. I just have a normal life like you have the same way. But if you look at it with kids, you can't wait for your little new infant to grow up and say their first words. And their first words could be mama or dada. Their second word or third word was generally no, no. And the next word after that is a four-letter word. Mine, 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 mine. And the their possessions. They want it. And most of us have those same stages. We just know how to cover it up a little bit better as we get older, so we make it a little bit more socially correct. But we still have some of that same attitude that goes our way. Well, you know, last week we asked the question and answered that. Why is money so important to God? And if we could reduce all of last Sunday into one sentence, it probably would look like this. Because what we do with our money actually reveals our own spiritual value system. And so how we use our money generally is a thermometer of our heart and our value system. Now you think about that on the way home, and that's why money is important to God, because it reveals that, not to Him, He already knows our value system, but it reveals it to us so that now we can step up to the plate and say, all right, we need to have a mid-course correction. Or for the young people, it might be, you know what, I'm going to be acquiring more and more money as I get older, and I need to make sure my values drive my money and not my money driving my values. So it is important to do that. It's important for a church to teach these things. First of all, we will be teaching it if we're teaching the Bible. Contrary to what some other people that might criticize preachers who talk or teach on money, the Bible is loaded. 800 verses alone just deals with money and possessions, and Jesus Christ spoke so much of it in Scripture. So for me not to speak on it, I would not be handling the Word of God correctly or accurately, and so I do need to speak on it. Yet I want you to know that I will not use this pulpit nor the Bible to whip any of you regarding money, and I'm not trying to dip into your pockets to give more to the church. We're not giving this series because we need more money. God has been good to us through the faithfulness of God's people. But at the same time, it's to help you. Ultimately, the bottom line is, here it is, we want to glorify God. 
with everything that we have and everything that we are. And part of that is how we use what God has given to us. So let's begin to discover God's mind on money and answer the question, is it wrong to have money? And here it is. First of all, it is not wrong to have money. Now, all of these obviously will have a clarification, but bottom line is it's not wrong to have money. I'd like to give you three reasons why it is not wrong to have money. The first one is pretty simple, and that is that all money and resources belong to God. If having resources and money would be wrong, then God would be a sinner. And of course, we know that's not the case. And so we need to find out what God has to say about it. So here's a number of verses. Let me let the verse itself speak for itself. In Haggai, the Lord speaking, he says, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And then in Psalm 50, verse 10 and 11, it says, Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the, of the field are mine. But I like the last part. It says, For the world is mine, and all its fullness... For just a moment right now, I think if we're honest enough to admit that there are still gas and oil reserves that have not been yet discovered in planet Earth somewhere. All of that belongs to the Lord. There is still gold and silver yet to be found and mined on this earth. God owns all of that. He owns all the universe. Everything belongs to the Lord. So we know that that's not wrong. Now, for some of you that are new on your journey to discover God, I don't want you to think that because God has all of this that he's like Scrooge and he's greedy with everything that he has. Listen carefully to this phrase. All of the sources of our resources is found in God so that with his resources we then can glorify him by building the kingdom and we do that by taking care of our basic needs of life so we have stability in our life by helping those that are not as far along in finances as we are as well as to use it to make sure that God gets glorified through the truth of the Bible going out so Having money is not wrong because God owns everything and he's not a sinner. Here's number two. Because God says he gives the ability to acquire money and possessions to us. That's true. He has it all. But it's like he has the mind there and we have to dig it out. And he gives us the ability to do that. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 at the beginning of it, Moses is writing the fifth book of the Pentateuch and it's kind of like a capitulation of everything else that's happened and a kind of a reminder and it says this and you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get well now if we had the time it'd be a wonderful chapter to open up but basically there's a key word in that chapter read it for yourself it's the word forget here it's the word remember it talks about how that when we get so much stuff we have a tendency to forget that it came from God or we actually forget God. And here he's trying to remind us to say that, listen, you need to remember that God gave you the ability to all of this. So whether you have it or not and how you got it, it's still at the source that God gave it to you. Now, I got thinking, now, how did God give me the things that I have? Now, we could talk about inheritances. Some of you have been blessed with an inheritance. Some of you have been blessed with some other ways it has come to you. But I want to submit to you five ways that the Lord comes and he gives us the ability to acquire money or to hang on to money. Here's number one. He helps us by helping us work for it. The Bible says that there's a lot of stuff out there in the land of those who are willing to till it out. He who tills the land will be satisfied with bread. So he gives us the strength to work. Those of you that now have a job that have the ability to get to work, you have the ability to go into that job every day. Now, some of you, I know on Mondays, you're kind of crawling there on our fingers to get to work because we're so weak and tired from our weekend. I realize that. It happens to all of us. Busy weekend. But you know as well as I do that there are people now that they are too weak because of their age or maybe poor health that they would love to work, but they cannot work. We've had a man that's come to church quite frequently. He comes in off the bus, barely. He is looking for a handout. Sometimes we give him a little bit. I've talked to him many times about, can you sweep? Can you do something? He's in so much pain and he's so uncomfortable, he cannot work. He said, oh, pastor, if I could work, I want to work, but my body won't let me work. So one way the Lord helps us acquire is to give us the ability to work. And it could be physical ability. It could be the brain to be able to function on that particular job that you have. Maybe you're a butcher or a baker or a candlestick maker, but he gave you the skill set to be able to work, the strength and the thinking of how to get that job, let alone a place of employment. All right, number two. He helps us by helping us save for that. 
Now part of that saving comes underneath the power of the Holy Spirit to give us discipline, to be able to say no to the salespeople. And not all salespeople are evil. They're just trying to let you know their product or service and trying to explain why it would be good for you. But we're the ones that have the ability to say no or to say yes. So he gives us that ability. Here it says there's desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish person will waste it, squander it away. Number three. He gives us the ability to manage it. How do we acquire wealth? Well, maybe it's not only how we get wealth, but we ha can retain wealth because we have the ability to manage it properly. Here it says, through wisdom, a house is full, and by understanding, it's established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So you have wisdom and knowledge to be able to manage it. How does he help you with that? Now, folks... I know there are a lot of great books that are written on money management. There are a lot of Christians who write a lot of good material on money management. And I'm not here to denigrate any of that, but I would like to elevate one point. And that is, the best money management that you'll ever be able to read and learn is to first of all realize that everything that you have belongs to God and He gave you the ability to have it. The reason you have it now is to show to yourself what is your spiritual condition and where it needs to be tweaked and then to use that money to bring glory to Him by taking care of your needs, helping those that really have a legitimate need and building God's kingdom. And so He tells us that's the root of it. It's not about us. It's all about bringing glory to Him. And number four, how does He help us? By telling us that we can ask God for help. If we have a particular need, we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a need. And we can acquire resources. That would be either money or possessions through asking the Lord. This is a very simple verse. It's kind of open-ended, but I think it'll work. It says, be anxious for nothing, any bout of need that you have. But in everything, whatever you might have, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. Now, obviously, that's predicated on that you have faith. That when you want money, it's not to consume it upon your own lust so that you can have more toys to play with or more weapons to do warfare with other people with to break relationships. But you're asking for these money, for this money and possessions so that you have tools to help build relationships with one another and with God. So you can ask God for that. Well, let me just pause for a moment. If we had the time, and we don't, and I'm trying to make these messages not go as long as they have been, but if I had the time, I would love now to take a break in our service. And I'd like to take our little handheld microphone to almost anyone in here that you can give a testimony where that you had a legitimate need in your life and you knew no way where you're going to get that money from any place. But you knew enough of God's word that God was a God that knew you had a need. He allowed you to have that need. wasn't cruel to you. He allowed you to have that need for the purpose of you communicating with God in request of that so you would strengthen your prayer life you would strengthen your relationship with the Lord when He would then grant it unto you. And so, if I could pass that microphone around, I won't. But if I did, how many of you could give a public testimony that you had a need, you told nobody about that need, you honored that verse by going to the Lord and asking Him for it, and God provided for you a finance, a money, or a possession to meet that need right when you needed it. Would you raise your hand right now? And look, keep it up real high. I, those of you that are our guests and are not a part of our family, we did not send out an email ahead of time. Can you imagine how long we would be here if I handed the microphone? Especially to a couple of you. Not because you're long-winded, but because God has been really gracious toward you and done a lot for you. So if you're on the other side of this, I want you to know that when you ask God for bread, He won't give you a rock. He'll give you what you need. But remember, He much prefers to do it as a father to a child who asks as his child and you become a part of his family by faith in Jesus Christ and not by any good works so you do it by asking God and then number five this is kind of a a weird one here but it really does work and that is that you can acquire money by giving to those in need now we're not talking about health and wealth we're not gonna have guys come up with buckets and you give all the money you can so you get money back but the Bible does say that when someone has a legitimate need that God says, you take care of that need because it's my money I've given to you. You're a channel. You're a pipe. And I'm going to pass it through you to that person. And the more you pass it to them, the more I'll give back to you because the more I give to you, he says, I know you know now that you're willing to give it to others. So as fast as I can give it to you, you can then give it to others and I'll keep, keep your tank filled as well. So give to those that have a need. Look at the verse there. It says, he who gives to the poor will not lack but he who hides his eyes will have many curses 
Again, those of you that have been with us a long time, I'm reading a six-volume set on the life of Hudson Taylor. I've just finished a two-volume set written by someone else, actually his daughter-in-law and son. This one is a much deeper and, and it has a lot done more research on it because they had more material that's come up since the first one. What is so remarkable about Hudson Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission, was not only theologically he was so much like us in so many ways, but he was also someone who himself learned the principle of what is known as self-denial. And so as things came to him, he then would quickly give it to others, poor people or whoever had a legitimate need. Now, he didn't stand on the street corner and give out the money that was sent to him because he was a missionary. But he used that money to turn it into food that they, that, for the people that they needed it. For the purpose of that while those people were eating or before they would eat, he would then clearly give the salvation message by faith alone in Christ. And it seemed like many times he would be down to the last little bit and he didn't know how he'd be able to feed himself. So all the food that was left over was a little bit of rice gruel that he would have for himself. And he didn't know when the next ship would come in because often the ships would take four months to come from his supporters. And oddly enough, by the next day, someone would send him 40 pounds, which is m English money at that time, to take care of his needs. Again, how many of you could give a testimony today? Where that in some measure you've learned that it's not about you, it's about others. And at times you do have to break from your need to give to someone else who has a need. But not just to make that person a better person to die and go to hell. But to help further the kingdom work. And then God supernaturally then, without you even asking now, he brought it right back to you. Now those of you that are the other side of this, I'm not going to parade in front of you people that have been sick and are now healthy. I'd rather parade in front of you just normal people like you and me that's seen a God work according to his divine word right here in their life. And so is it wrong to have money? No, it's not wrong to have money because God has all the money that we'd ever need and then he helps us to acquire that which we need for our life, for the needs of others and to build his kingdom. But here's a third reason and that is that God does not condemn having money. And why is that? Very similar to what I just said. Because money and possessions were used to meet the needs of others. Now this is very interesting because since we have people that are needy around us, and this would be a great family discussion, why didn't God give them the money since they had the need directly? Why did he give us the ability to have that money? And then we then have to be the channel to give it to them. Why did he do that? That would be a wonderful discussion. Go through scripture and find some illustrations. But the bigger way you'll answer that is because God is using these methods to build a relationship, watch, with him first, but also building a relationship with other people. And sometimes he has to give it to one and then he'll give it to the other. I often like to look at it this way, that when God gives me something to help someone else out and I help them out because I want them to be strong, because I know that there's going to be a cycle of me having and having not, that when I don't have something, that other person would be strong, and hopefully spiritually, that should I have a need, God could then lay it upon their heart to give to me who has a need now, because I've made them rich. You know what I mean by rich? By giving to them. And what does that do? That keeps the family in harmony working together. That's the joy of this whole thing. So, we have this. And he doesn't condemn us for this. It's something that we can do to help others. And the second one is very similar, and that is that money and possessions were just transferable co commodities. And some great verses there. It says, And all those who would believe were together. They had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone had need. Now, it wasn't socialism. They weren't required to do that. They weren't commanded to do that. They chose to do that on their own just to meet a need. It goes on to say, for there was not a needy person among them. Why? For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would distribute to each that had a need. Now, would you look up here for just a moment? I want to just spin sideways for a second on this topic. Some of you might be hearing all of this, and because the title is, is it wrong to have money, that your mind is just, it's only money that I can give. And I often find that people of means often will do a lot of good stuff for other people by just throwing money at it. Some of the big churches in the mainland that are very, very wealthy, those wealthy people often don't get their hands dirty for God, but they'll hire everybody else to do it. I haven't yet figured out is that wrong or right, but in my mind I'd often like to see some of the wealthy people, there are means we might say, get a little bit dirty for God, to kind of get involved in people's lives rather than dropping a sizable check in the offering. But coming back to this, I wanted you to know you might not have the money to do that. And so in this case, it might be that you're going to help someone in need because you're going to give something that is sometimes even more valuable than money. And what's four-letter word would that be? Anybody? 
Time. I heard it right off. Time. And we then can give time. And so we take our skill set. We come alongside someone who's really can't do it. They cannot do it. We don't have a lot of money, but we're going to take something that's more valuable to us as the time and give it to them. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know how it's going to happen, but God sees that. And God honors that back again. So he doesn't condemn us for having skill sets and money when we're willing to sacrifice money and time to help someone else out. What a special blessing that that is. Well, now, once we've done that, it brings us to the next question. If it's not wrong to have money, then what is wrong? And here it is, number two. It is wrong to love money. I think you know that. This is a smart group that's listening here today. But the real question is, is how's your heart? Have you taken a, a heart check? Not a heart pill, but a heart check? Some people like to say, if you had a check up from the neck up on this thing, do you really love money or not? Well, God does two things. He first gives us cautions, and then he gives us consequences. So he gives us cautions about our money, but he also gives us consequences if we love our money. So let's look at the cautions first. First of all, number one, there's the desire is never satisfied. When you love money, when you love money, it's never really satisfied. The verse says here, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with the silver. That's funny. If he loves silver, why won't he be satisfied with it? Because the satisfaction never really ends. You got to have more. You got to have more. Back in 1985, there was a man by the name of Ivan Bosky. He was a stock speculator. And I took a quote from a presentation he made publicly. So I'm only quoting him publicly. And here's what he said. He said, greed is healthy. That was back in 1985. There was a man who wrote a movie, his name was Stone, and he produced that movie, and the movie was called Wall Street. And he took that same philosophy that seemed to be very pervading our, our philosophy of money management in the 80s, and that movie called Wall Street, like I said. There was a phrase in that writ, said by Gordon uh, Gecko, and he said simply, greed is good. Well, bottom line is, it's never good, and greed is never healthy. And the more you want, because you're driven by greed, the more you have to have, and it's just like a slippery slope that'll drag you down. It's very, very dangerous to have that. So let me just warn you that those of you that love money, love money, all right, that it'll never be satisfied. As soon as you have this much, you're going to need more. Rockefeller was asked when he was a rich man, how much more money do you need to have to make you happy? He says, just a little bit more. Seems like he was never fully happy, even though he had more money than you and I, probably all of us, put together. Number two, it's wrong to love money. God gives careful cautions. What's the next caution? That is there's a desire. That desire for money shows a lack of contentment. A lack of contentment. Now Madison Avenue is there to design all the wonderful marketing that they do to make us feel so discontent with our lifestyle or what we have or how we need to keep up or what more things will do for us that they, they're designed to make us feel less content with what we have and gives us the illusion that what we need will give us the contentment that we don't have now. And it really is an illusion. Now, this verse was wonderfully read to us by our friend Jerry. But let me go back over it a little bit more carefully. Follow along in your little worship notes there. It goes like this. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's very interesting that really the gain in our life is when we finally say enough is enough. In a particular book called Your Eternity Portfolio that I referred to last week, there's a whole section in there that I've seen that I've never seen in any other book on money management. And I haven't read every book, but I've read an awful lot of them. And this book is that you as a family finally have to decide when is enough enough and live off of what is enough is enough instead of keep trying to build your, um, your war chest more and more and more and more. And that's something I can't answer for you. It's something that's going to be a threshold between contentment and perhaps probably desire, lust, or greed. I don't know, but think about that. But it goes on to say, for we brought nothing into the world. That's right, we came into the world naked, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You know, when we die, they tell us that sometimes if you don't provide the body with his own clothes, the mortuary will put clothes on him, and those clothes on a man will be a pair of slacks, and there'll be no pockets in it. Why? Because he can't take anything with him. And it says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. You might want to mark that in your notes. Having food and clothing with these shall be content. Maybe right now what you want to work on and meditate on is, am I really satisfied with food and clothing? And how much do I really need? What's, what moves from a need to a greed? I don't know. But it says, but those who desire to be rich. Now, there's nothing wrong with acquiring money. There's nothing wrong with your boss, who's a, maybe a sales manager, setting some goals for you to maybe get some more money. But be very careful when they start making you feel like you need more money because you're not anything unless you have more. 
I think that's very dangerous. When I was a young man, you teenagers might appreciate this. This is going to show you how old and moldy your pastor is. But I grew up in an environment where they wouldn't let rock music be played in the morning on Sunday on any of the radio stations in town. But at noon, then all hell would break loose and you could listen to all the rock. Now, I wasn't saved at the time, so I was really bummed out every Sunday morning. I'd have to sit and listen to this old weird religious stuff and old you know documentaries on the radio and I hated it Sunday mornings were so boring this is Joe Pons and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the word of God with clarity into every person's world It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.